Namaskar and welcome to NPTEL online certification course on Indian poetry in English. You are listening to these lectures by Binod Mishra and uh, today we are going to talk about Sarojini Naidu, one of the famous uh, poets of the first phase of Indian poetry writing in English. But before we go on uh, to uh, understand uh, the poetic technique, the poems, it is always better to have a look at who Sarojini Naidu was and what were the condition uh, in her time when she was writing poetry. Now let us have a look at the socio-political conditions. My dear friends, you have already been listening uh, in, several, in, in several lectures uh, that when Indian poetry writing in English began, there were some women poets, especially the British uh, poets who started writing. But soon afterwards, uh, there were also some Indian women who started writing poetry and Sarojini Naidu was one such. Now, during that time, the political condition and the social condition of India was passing through a very critical stage. Women were uh, most of the time excluded from political culture, even though nationalism was on the rise and the world was also witnessing several events, several walks were being fought. Uh, there was a time when uh, the uh, voting rights for women, they were also a question and especially in India, uh, Indian women were passing through a very critical condition uh, when for the first time Raja Ram Mohan Rai uh, started uh, talking about uh, women's rights and all. There were child marriages, uh, there was uh, the condition of widows. Uh, so during that time, writing poetry was of course a very challenging task. And it was at that time that Sarojini Naidu appeared on the scene. Now, who was uh, Sarojini Naidu? Sarojini Naidu, as we'll come to know later, was born in Hyderabad. Fine, but then during that time, we could also find that those women who were writing poetry, they were confined only to domestic and personal affairs. So that used to be uh, the theme. But then. Some poets, namely along with uh, Sarojini Naidu, though we have already come to know that Toru Dutt had started uh, writing poetry quite earlier and then came Cornelia Sorabji and then Sarojini Naidu and some also other important poets. Sarojini Naidu was a representative of the Orient. When we come to see the expanse and the canvas of her poems, we will find that how she was a representative of the Orient. And not only was she a poet, but she was also a very famous orator. And uh, on many situations, when she spoke, the audience members were spellbound. Uh, and, and that is how uh, she also got a chance to enter into uh, the uh, political arena of uh, that time uh, in Indian settings. So Hyderabad ladies uh, war relief in 1915 addressing the sacrifice of Indian mothers on behalf of an ungrateful empire, recited Sarojini's poem, The Gift of India. My dear friends, as I have been telling you that she was born in 1879, 1879. I mean, as I told you in the previous lecture as well, uh, that after Sepoy mutiny uh, was over, the political conditions in India uh, became more severe and it became more aggressive rather. So, Sarojini was born in a Bengali Brahmin family, but she was born in Hyderabad and she was so talented that it is said that only at the age of 12, she had uh, matriculated and at the age of 16, she visited England on a fellowship uh, from uh, the Nijam of Hyderabad. And this fellowship actually took her to uh, London where she studied and she came into contact with many famous poets, critics, writers of those days. But then Sarojini had one impediment and the impediment was uh, that she was actually in love with a person who was from a different caste and she wanted to marry uh, that person uh, who was a doctor, Dr. Govind Raju Naidu. Even though Sarojini's father, father Agorna Chattopadhyay, who was himself a doctor, uh, but then he perhaps, and not only the father, but uh, the family members along with uh, the mother as well, they objected to uh, Sarojini's advances towards Gobindraju, but Sarojini wanted to uh, marry Gobindraju. So she returned to India in 1893 
married Govind Raju Naidu and then her literary sparks had been quite visible right at the age of uh, uh, 13 when she had written a poem uh, which was more than uh, 1000 lines. Now uh, to her career there were several achievements. She actually became at, at a very uh, small age she had become uh, the president of Indian National Congress uh, in 1925. So this was really uh, a, a sort of uh, jealousy uh, to many other people who could not have attained that status at such an age. And uh, in her political strides, because she was highly influenced by the political views of Gandhi, Gokhale and many others. Uh, and and uh, she also took part in several political stripes and struggles. And uh, she had been very close to uh, Gandhiji. Uh, and, and then uh, it, is, it is only the result of that Sarojini could become the president of Indian National Congress in 1925. Uh, Gandhi was so infatuated with uh, the poetic charms, uh, the oratorial skills of uh, Sarojini Naidu uh, that he always used to call her uh, the uh, Varat Kokila or the songbird, the Indian cuckoo, the nightingale of India. Sarojini breathed her last on 2nd March 1949 when she was actually uh, the governor of uh, UP. Uh, now uh, Sarojini's uh, poetic overs because uh, when she went to England uh, she got in con into contact with so many uh, uh, famous uh, poets, writers and critics. Uh, she was highly influenced by uh, the romantic poets especially Keats, Shelley, Tennyson uh, and uh, Browning and she was not confined only to the romantics but she was also uh, influenced by Victorian poets and then Rossetti and Swinburne too had uh, 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 influenced uh, her and especially as regards her achievements she had actually uh, got several uh, you know laurels uh, to her credit. And it is said that when she wrote her first uh, book of poems and uh, in, in, in uh, contact with uh, Edmund Goss who was a famous uh, English writer and critic and especially the Rhymers Club uh, and, and then Edmund Goss and Arthur Simmons, all these people had appreciated her poetic sparks. So when uh, she sold her first poem to Edmund Goss, Edmund Goss had advised her why should not she write about India, Indian uh, mountains, Indian rivers, Indian cultures and all and that really had a great effect on uh, Sarojini's uh, poetic uh, over. So in order uh, um, uh, to influence and in order uh, to see the spark that was there what Edmund Goss had said to set her poems firmly among the mountains, the gardens, the temples to introduce to us the vivid population of her own voluptuous and unfamiliar provinces in other words to be a genuine Indian poet of the Deccan not a clever machine like imitator of English classics. Here you may uh, be reminded of uh, that many other poets who had started writing poetry in pre-independent days they were actually imitating. But Sarojini even though Sarojini also in the beginning imitated but Sarojini had her own voice and Sarojini had her own technique and that has made Sarojini Naidu very popular. Uh, she started with the smaller poems. But what is uh, quite significant about Sarojini Naidu is that she is not confined to one theme. One can find uh, the ordinary life visible through her poems and the title of her poems if you have a look at uh, you, you will find that she was not writing for one class but she had her sympathies uh, to the people of all classes. For example, uh, she also wrote poems for Bengal sellers. Uh, then she uh, wrote poems for Indian weavers. She was also very much influenced uh, by uh, nature and that is why her poetic world is replete with champak trees, uh, then sirisas and then many others. She has also talked about some of the Indian seasons like Basant Panchmi. She also exposed herself uh, to her knowledge of uh, Indian myths and Indian gods and goddesses like Kali, Lakshmi and uh, many of the Indian saints also influenced her. So one of her poems to a Buddha seated on a lotus has also become very famous. Edmund Gosse went on to say about uh, uh, Sarojini Naidu that if the poems of Sarojini can be carefully and delicately studied they will be 
found as luminous in lighting as luminous in lighting up the dark places of fist as any contribution uh, of a savant historian as any contribution of a savant historian. Now, what was so significant in the poetic world of Sarojini Naidu we will have uh, when once we read some of the poems we can find out though many of the poems many of you might have read in your school and college days and you could have found the beauty that was there. It is always said uh, that of all the poets writing in pre-independent India Sarojini had the pleasantest ear meaning thereby there was a lot of rhyme in Sarojini's poetry and that was actually the originality. Uh, Sarojini wrote uh, 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 poems, but some of her collections are very important. Uh, here you can find the names of uh, those collections. The very first uh, book, The Golden Threshold, which came out in 1905, it had actually got 40 poems. And you know the title of this poem uh, was taken uh, by uh, the name of the house in Hyderabad where she was living. And then came the bird of time which is also influenced by Fitzgerald's uh, Omar Khayyam and then the broken wing. It is often said that when Sarojini wrote uh, broken uh, wing in 1907 many people started looking at Sarojini with certain doubts and certain disillusionments and of course the title also says uh, the same thing. Uh, now many people often say uh, that because of her participation I mean active participation in politics and because of her uh, uh, say a disillusionment with the sort of life that she was le leaving because most of the time she used to be ill and perhaps she had uh, developed a sort of a sadistic attitude and that is why the broken wing. So, when the broken wing came Gokhale once asked uh, Sarojini uh, that how come a songbird like you write uh, a poem or a collection like the broken wing and you know Sarojini was very witty. So, she answered you see even with the broken wing I can scale the stars. So, she was very witty and then the last one which you can find here this is actually the collection of her poems which could not be published during her lifetime and uh, it was published later in 1961 under the title the feather of the down the feather of the down now sarojini even though she was a bengali she was writing in english and when it uh, came uh, to uh, discuss about discuss uh, on the aspect of language what Sarojini says is a very eye opener and it is very remarkable as she says be masters of whatever language you like as long as it is the language of the human heart and spirit human heart and spirit my dear friend. What do I mean by uh, human heart and spirit? By human heart and spirit what we mean is something that comes out of your soul, something that comes out of your heart meaning thereby the pleasant song and that is what Sarazuni is famous for. Now, what actually are the themes? As I told you in the beginning that Sarojini is not confined to one theme only. She has in her and the entire poetic corpus of Sarojini can be divided into certain you know categories. She actually wrote about love, she wrote about nature, she wrote uh, love lyrics, she wrote uh, some folk songs and she also wrote about life and death. These are actually the common themes, but in all the common things what is at the center point is or what is in the background is love because right from the beginning she tried to explore love not only among human beings, but among natural objects, among animals, among people of all, all categories devoid of their profession. Sarojini's poems are symbolic, sentimental, at times it may appear to be very vague. It is often said uh, that Sarojini even though she uh, her mother tongue was Bengali and you know at a later stage she felt that she was not doing much even for her own mother tongue. Uh, she should have uh, written either in Bengali or in Urdu because she was in Hyderabad, but she was writing in English. So, but then there was actually a flash of British romanticism in her poems and many people have also gone to the extent of saying that it is only because of that realization uh, that Sarojini uh, wrote uh, the uh, collection uh, Broken Wing because that talks about uh, somehow or the other the pessimism of uh, the poet, the pessimism of Sarojini Naidu.
Now, one of the poems which you might have come across during your school days, which is actually, which is very famous for its rhyme, which is very famous for its musicality. But then while Sarozni wrote this poem entitled Palanquin Bearers, you can find how she can convert a simple theme into a very magnanimous and how she can provide music. If you read the poem, uh, because Sarozni was very fond of meters. And you will find the way she writes, lightly or oh lightly we bear her along, she sways like a flower in the wind of our song. She skims like a bird on the foam of a stream, she floats like a laugh from the lips of a dream. Gaily or oh gaily we glide and we sing, we bear her along like a pearl on a string. If you have a look only at this stanza, you can find it is not only full of literary devices like simile. But then at the same time, you can see the comparison that she has made of a bride. My dear friends, nowadays, can anyone think of uh, the pa palanquin or the palaki in Hindi? Fine, even the Western uh, uh, people who happen to uh, see, uh, uh, who happen to read this poem could not imagine that in Indian scenario, a bride can be carried on a, pal uh, on a palanquin. And then the people who are uh, carrying it, uh, who are carrying it, they are also singing and at the same time uh, the poet's voice can be heard lightly, oh lightly we bear her along. She sways like a flower in the wind of our song. So the bride is going uh, to her uh, marital, marital place uh, and then not only lightly, in every now and then you can find a lilting rhythm, softly or oh, softly we bear her along. She hangs like a star in the duo of our song. You can read the poem at leisure and at your own pleasure and you can derive pleasure out of it. This poem has been very common in majority of the schools and colleges and sometimes in university also. But what the poem actually tells us is how India can provide others a sort of exotic view of India. I mean, many people could not have thought of uh, India having a sort of palanquin, a tradition of palanquin and the bride going in it. So it actually talks about Indian culture, uh, it talks about uh, the Indian bride and also talks about the practice of the bearers. Now the question here is, the entire poem, if we analyze it linguistically and if we uh, analyze it in a lyrical mode, we can find that there is a profound use of dactyl and anapistic meter. You might be thinking what this dactyl and anapistic meter is. I mean, dactyl is actually when there is one stressed and then two unstressed syllables. So that is actually dactyl and the anapistic meter is just the reverse of it. One unstressed and two stressed. And the entire poem goes like this and that actually makes the poem quite melodious my dear friend. There is a sort of cadence as I told you and it actually evokes a beautiful uh, and embellished imagery. But then as I told you that while on the one hand she talks about, because you know Sarojini had in her uh, the technique that she will not talk only about one class, one person, one caste whatsoever, she also talks about another, another lady who is actually veiled and her veiled beauty is uh, deliberated upon in the poem Pardanashi. And in, in that, not only does she sing about the Pardanashi or the veiled beauty, uh, but then she also talks about the confinement that was there, even though it is of a tradition, but she actually talks about how there used to be a sort of confinement. And if you can read some of the lines, you can find her life is a revolving dream. Now see, under the curtain, under the veil, she can simply dream of, of languid and sequestered ease, her girdles and her fillets gleam like changing fires on sunset seas, her raiment is like morning mist, sought opal, gold and amethyst. See the rhyme. From thieving light of eyes impure, from coveting sun of wind scarce, her days are guarded and secure behind her caravan lattices. And the poem goes on and goes on my dear friend and you can enjoy. And there again is abundance of the use of literary devices, 
you will find every word that actually uh, begins with like jewels in, like jewels in a turban crest, like secrets in a lover's breast. Be thou no hand unsanctioned dears, unveil the mysteries of her grace. How beautiful she is, but then she is veiled. Who shall prevent these subtle ears or seal the woman's eyes from tears? So she not only talks about the dream, but she also talks about how she might be having a sort of feeling uh, that she is confined here under, you know, under a cover. And this, this cover actually talks about all her uh, frustrations and all her dreams. Now, when we have an analytical look and a critical look at the poem, we can find that it not only talks about beauty, but it also talks about a time when you know, uh, being veiled was a custom and it was a sort of traditional, you know, uh, it was a sort of traditional uh, mode during those days. Women happen to be prisoners. So, in a way, Sarozni is also trying to give the message to the outside world that why this veiled? Where is the identity of the woman who is actually uh, veiled? The ending is quite uh, uh, rhetorical and you can also enjoy the rhyme scheme which goes like A, B, A, B, C, C. So, if you read the entire poem, you will find. So, through this poem also, on the one hand, we talk about palanquin bearers and on the other, we talk about pardanashi. We will also take up some other poems where you can find the technique and the art of Sarojini as a poetess. As I told you, that a poet like Sarojini cannot be confined to only one theme or to one genre. You remember my dear friends that Sarojini's, Sarojini actually uh, got noticed by these political uh, leaders namely Gandhiji and uh, Gokhale who actually were uh, very much attracted not only by her oratory skills, but by her poetic skills as well. And this is here a poem which actually is titled The Lotus and you know this poem is actually dedicated to Gandhi. Sarozni was so witty that there were times when she even called Gandhi the Mickey Mouse, fine. But then nobody took it otherwise because, because Sarojini was as natural as the wind, she was as natural as the river. And if we have a look at this poem Lotus, where she talks about, where not only she talks about the plain living, where not only does she talk about the non-violence, where not only she talks about the merits of Gandhi, but through this Lotus flower, Actually, she tries to give a message and let us have a look at some of the lines. And you know, the poem begins uh, with an apostrophe, O mystic lotus, sacred and sublime. See, see the use of words, sacred and sublime. So here on the one hand, she talks about how lotus is considered uh, sacred and lotus as you all know is a national flower of India. So, since she had entered politics, she had started writing or she had started scribbling some political poems, which perhaps were going to bring a sort of decline to her career as a poet. My dear friends, poetry and politics have very rarely been successful together. And that also happened with Sarozni Naidu, a poem of such a great significance and such a great height. O mystic lotus, sacred and sublime, O myriad petaled grace, inviolate, supreme over transient forms of tragic fate, deep rooted in the waters of all time. What legions lose from many a far off climb, of wild beholds with lips insatiate, and hungry winds with wings of hope or hate. And as the poem goes, and finally, but who could win thy secret? Who attain thine ageless beauty born of Brahma's breath? Now, here she says, you are born of Brahma's breath or pluck the immortality who are coeval with the lords of life and death. So, now Sarozni actually tried to give it a different angle, a different push and it is said that the poem was actually dedicated to Mahatma Gandhi. As I have been telling you that Sarojini was a poet who could not be confined in one category. Now, she has her eyes not only on Indian weavers or Bengal sellers or the, uh, 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 or the bajars, but she also could talk of and majority of the poems which are soaked in love, 
Here she talks about uh, in, in one of the poems a love song from the north. Likewise, there is a poem named um, uh, a, Rajput, uh, a Rajput's love. It is based on Rajput's love. So, this poem a love song from the north it is also one of the very significant poem if uh, here you will find the Indian images are replete, Indian images are full of here she will not talk about skylark, here she will not talk about some other bird, but she will talk about Indian birds and how she tries actually are to bring in or to render Indian color to her poetic over. Let us have some lines, tell me no more of thy love puppy ha. Huh? Wouldst thou recall to my heart, puppy, ha? Huh? Dreams of delight that are gone when swift to my side came the feet of my lover. With the stars of the dusk and the down, I see the soft wings of the clouds on the river, and jeweled with raindrops the mango leaves quiver, and tender boughs flower on the plain. And as the poem proceeds, but what is their beauty to me, puppy, ha? Huh? Even even when she is talking of love. But then she knows that this love is going to be very temporary. She is here also going to talk about separation. How come I be separated from my lover? So even even though uh, you even, even though Papiha you are singing, but how am I affected? What is their beauty to me, Papiha? Beauty of blossom and sour Papiha that brings not my lover again. If I am not able to meet my lover again, how, 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 how does uh, your you know, song affect me? So, here this poem not only talks about longing, it also talks about how separation can affect two lovers and here she is singing. So, she was actually basically she was a singer and that is why she has been called a song bird, a song bird, a song bird, but then how can a person remain a songbird every now and then? Sometimes we are reminded of how our sweetest songs are those that consist of our saddest thought and that also happened with Sarojini. So, as she proceeded because at a very early stage she had become very famous, but once she entered uh, politics, once she entered the political struggle and all her poetry actually came to have a sort of decline. It is also said uh, that Sarojini never uh, was uh, quite healthy, she always had been suffering from one ailment or the other, but this did not have a mark or this did not have an effect on her poetry because even out of her suffering the sort of poetry that she was writing, the sort of, uh, this, this sort of strain that she was creating that actually was uh, full of love. Tell me no more of thy love, Papiha. Wouldst thou revive in my heart, Papiha? Would you be able to revive in my heart, Papiha? Grief for the joy that is gone. The past days, the past pleasant days, the past days of love, the past experiences, the past moments which are gone, will you be able to? So, see, in a way, talks about how, you know, time also passes, but with time, everything is also gone. I hear the bright peacock in glimmering woodlands. So, I hear the bright peacock's glimmering woodlands cry to its mate in the down. Now, here she uh, provides a symbol of the peacock and says that how peacocks in glimmering woodlands cry to its mate in the down. I hear the black quail's slow tremulous wing. So, all the voices of temptation or the voices of wing, sweet in the gardens, the calling and the queen of passionate bulbul and dove. But what is their music to me, Papiha? Songs of their laughter and love, Papiha, to me forsaken of love. It is often said that there were certain things in her own life that actually uh, could not make her uh, so happy and that some way or the other uh, could come to be a part of her uh, poetry, part of her muse. My dear friends, Sarojini Naidu as an Indian English poet, when one goes to estimate Sarojini Naidu as an Engli Indian English poet, though many people had said many things, even one of the uh, famous uh, you know uh, scholars uh, both of uh, Maithili and English lit literature Dr. Amarnaja who had been in constant friendship and in constant correspondence with Sarojini Naidu had said Sarojini was half a sister, half a mother to me 
and how could I assess Sarojini Naidu? So, my dear friends, when Sarojini, when, when we are going to estimate Sarojini, Sarojini's over is too wide. Songs of love, songs of love and death, so folk songs, as she also writes folk songs, and she also talks about love and also of separation of death, my dear friends. So, when we finally estimate Sarojini Naidu and ask ourselves why Sarojini Naidu should be considered an Indian English poet, there are certain things that we can keep in mind. The first is there is abundance of Indian scene. You can come across uh, Champak, you can come across Sirisa, you can come across uh, Indian birds, no? Koel, Bulbul and many other things as well. And then you can also find Indian gods and goddesses and she was not confined only to one god or one goddess. She actually exposed herself and showed her familiarity with other. She talks about the milkmaid Radha, you know, she talks about the milkmaid Radha and when she talks about Radha, when she talks about Radha, she depicts her as how she was taking her curd to Mathura and when on the boat she was trying to cross the river and people were trying to make a fun of her, suddenly out of her, a throat came Govinda, Govinda. Now, the question is a poet which so much steeped in Indian culture can only be none other than Sarojini Naidu. So, not only the themes are Indian, but symbols and landscapes are also Indian, my dear friend. You can come across the songs of uh, Krishna and Allah, Radha and Gulnar. And in all these, you know, these are suffused with evocative and original use of imagery. Uh, she is uh, actually very much proficient at creating fridges, creating fridges and those fridges will have something of its Indian, you know, origin and something of its Indian tinge. And one can also find a sharp and comical sense, a witty sense in Sarojini's world, in Sarojini's poetic world. Uh, uh, there is the one comment that actually needs to be taken care of when we talk about Sarojini Naidu's entire poetic corpus where she says, she brought prestige to Indian English writing long before Tagore received the Nobel Prize. This is, this is what M. K. Nayak, a famous Indian critique and writer of the book A History of Indian English Literature says, so she actually brought prestige to India much before Tagore received the Nobel Prize and her best poetry is not just a faded echo of the feeble voice of decadent romanticism, but an authentic Indian English lyric utterance exquisitely tuned to the composite Indian ethos, Indian ethos my dear friend, bringing home to the unbiased reader all opulence, pageantry and charm of traditional Indian life and the splendors of Indian scene. So, you will find whichever poem you take from any of her collections, you will find it is not only steeped in Indian ethos, Indian strain, Indian landscape, Indian imagery, but at the same time it talks about gods and goddesses, it talks about deities, it talks about the celebrated people of Indian culture and that is what makes Sarojini Naidu a famous Indian poet. Now, to sum up, we can take some of the points in order uh, to consider Sarojini Naidu as one poet without whom Indian poetry writing in English in pre-independent days could not be a possibility. Naidu has presented varied and vivid pictures of Indian life as I have been saying. And you know, the earlier poems, if you have a look at, they are full of the youthful imagination. And then her language is very flowery. When I say flowery, very ornate, everyone can understand. It is not that she picks up difficult words or whatsoever. The language is very simple, but it actually provides us a lilting musicality or a lilting rhythm. She makes abundant use of ancient Indian myths and literary devices. There is an element of picturesque quality. At times you can find that there are certain things which are repetitive, lightly or lightly, softly or softly. And then again in many poems you can find like that. Sometimes you can find that triplicatives have been used uh, quite frequently. The metrical quality of her verse makes her an all time favorite Indian poetess of a great caliber. So, my dear friends, without Sarojini Naidu, 
the pre-independent or the first phase of Indian English poetry cannot be complete. So, Sarozni was a poet of love, she was a poet of nature, she was a poet of Indian ethos, she was a poet of Indian tradition and she was also, we can also find some influences of the West, but then as she had been reminded by Edmund Goss and that actually became an eye opener for her and that is what we can say. And before I end, let me end this lecture by taking some lines from one of the poems of Naidu herself. The poem is titled To the God of Pain where she says, I have no more to give, all that was mine is laid arrested tribute at thy shrine. Let me depart, for my whole soul is rung, and all my cheerless horizons are sung. Let me depart with faint limbs, let me creep to some dim shade and sink me down to sleep. This appears to be a sort of surrender to the Almighty, uh, who all of us are in awe of, and Sarozni too, was also in awe of God and she breathed her last when she was the governor uh, of Lucknow. So, this, with this we come to the end of this lecture on Sarajni Naidu. Thank you very much for a patient listening.